Start to say good morning. But good evening. Thank you for coming out tonight. Just uh, one announcements reminder: uh, Saturday at 4:30, we'll be having our grandparents' celebration, honoring our grandparents. Everyone in the church is invited to come. All Sister Linda asks is if you just sign up, so she knows how many people are coming. So if you haven't signed up, please sign up tonight. That way, she knows for Saturday. It begins at 4.30. We'll have uh, dinner in the back, and then the amb ambassador choir will be singing in here in the sanctuary. So please make plans to be here with us Saturday at 4.30 to honor our grandparents. That's all the announcements. Let's stand tonight. Let's open in prayer and ask God just to be here with us tonight. Father, we thank you again for another time, another opportunity, Lord, to come together and to worship you. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day, Lord, that you have made. And Father, I pray as we enter into worship, God, let us enter into worship in spirit and in truth. God, let us lay aside every care, every weight, everything that would hinder us. And God, give us the freedom and the liberty we need to worship you. Father, we ask it all in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Sister Darla is going to come lead us to worship tonight. I was just thinking he sanitized the uh, microphone. That's what that <laughs> was. But, uh, you know, I'm covered by the blood anyway, so I don't worry about it. But uh, something that I've learned over my walk with Christ is that every day is sweeter. Every day gets, gets better and better and better. Every day that I walk with my Lord. So that's the first song is Every Day with Jesus is Sweeter Than the Day Before.
the Lord. I pulled up a scripture because I just wanted to read a scripture before this next song. Philippians 2.9 tells us this. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. I thought that was a really, I mean, I've read it before, that everything's going to bow at the name of Jesus. Amen? And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So all the songs tonight are about the name of Jesus. We can't lift up the name of Jesus enough. Because he is so good. He keeps me singing. you glad he fills our every longing yes, he and then Jesus, Jesus is the sweetest name I know yes. best name that we can call out to
somebody know, use his name as a swear word. Some use his name just to say it and doesn't really have any meaning. When I think about the name of Jesus, I think about life. I was bound in darkness, trying, searching to find peace in my soul. But when I've called upon the name of Jesus, I found what I was looking for. And I can tell you tonight, His name is sweet, and He brings peace and relief to our hearts and lives. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer tonight. If you have a need, would you just slip up your hand toward heaven? God knows our needs before we ask, but He said, ask, and we shall receive. How many believes tonight God still hears and answers prayer? We just don't do this tonight because it's part of the service, and it's a ritual that we go through. We believe tonight God hears and answers prayer. So when we pray tonight, pray and believe. Start listening for the knock at the door. Start listening God, for God to send you the answer as we pray. Father, we thank you tonight for who you are. You are still King of all kings and Lord of all lords. And God, we know tonight there's not a sickness nor a disease, God, that you cannot heal. And Father, I pray tonight for every hand, God, that was raised in this building tonight. And God, those that are watching tonight that may be sick in their bodies. God, I pray you would reach down your great, mighty hand and touch them and deliver them from their sickness. God, we know tonight, God, you are greater than cancer. God, you are greater than pneumonia, diabetes, or whatever attacks our bodies. And God, we believe tonight, God, you're still a healer. God, you can speak a word. And God, our bodies can be made whole. And Father, I pray for every situation, every circumstance, God, that your people are dealing with tonight. God, we give it to you. And God, we ask for your help tonight. God, we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing this chorus tonight and thank God by faith that He is going to answer our prayer. Second, you know, whenever I first, we're going to sing in it a little bit more, a couple more of them. When I came back to Christ, there was all these cor new choruses, you know, that I'd never heard growing up. And I would go home from the services, and they're just so easy that all of a sudden you just find yourself just singing them. And I'd go to work after I got saved, and I'd just hum these songs all day long. 
And I had somebody call me a humming fool, and I'm like, well, let me tell you why I sing. Because Christ saved me. And so you might think, why are we singing these simple songs? It's because they're simple, and they go deep within your spirit. And you just find, there's other songs that you do that too. But God's good to us. God's good. He answers prayer. And He deserves our praise. So we're just, we're just going to sing a couple more lines of this. So just close your eyes because they're super simple. And let's just worship the Lord tonight for a few minutes. God is so good. Come on, give him a better hand of praise than that. He's good, isn't he? Amen. He's good tonight. Whether we had a good day or bad day, God's still good. Whether we got a headache, backache, or toe ache, God is still good. Amen. He doesn't change with our lives and the circumstances we have to go through. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Brother Roy is going to come and share the word tonight. While he's coming, I want to say I thank you for helping me out tonight. I got to tell on myself, Monday morning, I took Monday off. I asked Brother Roy if he'd teach tonight, because usually I study on Mondays for Wednesday, and I slept till 8 o'clock on Monday. I had done that for years. So I took Labor Day off, and then we worked at home. We planted 12 months and mowed the yard and did all kinds of work at home. So <laughs> thank you, Brother Roy. How many know even our pastor should get a day off? I tell you, I'm a pastor's son, so I've seen it and I know it. And you just don't understand sometimes what the pastor actually does. I had one guy kind of sit there and he thought, oh, well, all the pastor does is he just comes, gives a message on Sunday, Sunday night, and maybe on a Wednesday, and that's pretty much all he does. But no, pastor, especially ours, it's 24 hours a day. If he ain't studying, he's here at the church fixing something, doing something, or anything. So uh, I tell you, it's good that he got a day off. Good he got a day off. Um, I'm going to be talking to you guys. Um, if you want to turn into Second Kings, uh, I'm going to be get, uh, going off of some of the 17th, 18th, and the 19th chapter. Um. I have used this before in a sermon, not in the same way as this, but uh, this, is, this, is, this is one of my favorites um, because of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was uh, a man of God. Um, it says that in the scriptures. He talks about he is a man of God. And if you, if you do the history and you look through there and you see, especially on Israel's side, there wasn't very many good kings that were godly. Uh, especially on Israel's side. Judah had a, a few here and there that kind of come in and out, uh, but Hezekiah was one of them that, uh, you know, was all about the Lord. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about this, especially with, you know, how life is so rough and, and the way things hit us and struggle and, and things like this. And this whole thing is, I'm going to be talking to you about is, is the letter that he gets, Hezekiah gets. And basically, it's, it's, the devil for, it's the letter from the devil. 
Yeah, it, it's signed by the king of Assyria, but it, it's really uh, directly from there. So uh, right off the bat, we see here in Hezekiah, um, uh, he, he talks about here in the Old Testament, we read the story of how King Hezekiah received a letter. He received a letter. Here we see before this, with a little bit of back history, you know, he was doing what God has told him to do. He was doing everything he was supposed to be doing. He cut down all the, the poles, all the things from the other idols, and, and, you know, cut ties and all this other stuff, and was doing, you know, what God has told him to do. You know, True, it was signed by the king of Syria. Um, and I'm telling you, I'm going to slaughter this name so bad. Sin, yeah, sin, what is it? Sennacherib. Sennacherib. That sounds good enough to me. Uh, but it was sent directly from hell. The Assyrian, uh, in Syrian, it means man of sin. Also moon god who multiplies brothers. But... In Assyrian, the king's name means man of sin. You know, you just think about that. I mean, so basically, when we're going to go through this and in different parts of it and stuff like that, and, and and talk a little bit about this letter and how it represents our life and how so many times we've got the letter too. It might not be a directly like this. But we have got that letter. It, re it represents Satan, the god of this world, who is determined to create for himself a vast brotherhood of God-haters. He hates God. You know, he was, you know, Satan was one up there. I mean, he was up there. He was in you know, charge of the music and all that other stuff. And then he got to the point where he wanted to be more than what God is. So you see, now that he's got cast down... You know, I, I believe, and, and my this is me. I believe, you know, I, you know, Satan. He, you know, he's smart, but yet, in other words, he's kind of stupid because if you think about it, he's got to know what the end is. Right? He's got to know he can't beat God. So, to me, it's basically what he is doing is, is look, I hate you, God, so much, and I know eventually I'm going to be done but I'm going to take as many of your people as I can with me. And that's what it's all about. That's what he wants. This, this, uh, this tr uh, story is true, and it is recorded for our learning, and it teaches us about the very old tricks of the devil. Because he's always trying to trick us. He's always trying to mess with us. But you see, everything in the Bible, everything in the Bible, we can learn from. Everything in there teaches us something, shows us something. Either it strengthens us or it's words of wisdom. It's, it's to keep us from making the same mistakes or it's just encouragement to help us through tough times. In uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, he says, Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for admonitions, admonish, emotions, Upon whom the ends of the world are come. It's an, it's an example. It's an example. It's, a, it's something for us to look at. It's what it's saying. All these things happen for a reason. For you to see. To see his great works. To see that he will bring you through time and time again. To show you what happens when we follow and when we don't follow. But first, let's take a look at the historical backdrop of this scene. You see, Jerusalem was under siege by the mighty Assyrian army during the time this satanic letter was arrived. You know, the king and his host uh, had carried the ten tribes of Israel into captivity. So he's already taken care of Israel. Which Israel wasn't, you know, they were not of God whatsoever. Um, they were, you know, everything in them was... I mean, they were far, far from what, you know, God wanted. So here we see, he, you know, they carried them off, and as Israel had come under judgment for her immortality, or immortality uh, idolatry, and falling away. I mean, it's, it, it just tells you, he was, you know, they didn't follow God. So God finally was like, look, my protection's not on you no more. So this is what happens. The Bible says that Israel sold themselves to do evil and that the following 
resulted. Now, if you want to go, we were going to start out in 2 Kings 17, 21, and 23, or through 23, to read that. It says, For he tore Israel from the house of David, and, and, <clears throat> and they made Jerome, uh, Jerome, the son of uh, Nebat, king. Then Jerome drove Israel from the following the Lord and made them commit to great sin. But the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jerome, which he did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria, as it is to this day. So we see in this passage, Israel represents the backslidden, sin-saturated church of today. I mean, they were God's people, and they decided, you know, hey, you know, I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to do it my way, you know, and, and this is what happened. It was a full, it was full of compromise, sheer pleasure, and madness. Now think about that. How much of a lot of churches out there today is full of compromise? I mean, and today the churches are, are you know, it's starting to compromise more and more. You know, we don't want to. We don't want to talk about repentance or anything like that because we don't want to get anybody upset. We don't want to hurt feelings. Uh, we don't want to do that. So we're going to compromise about that. And I, I don't want to upset nobody, so we can't say this and we can't say that. Even though the Scripture says it, we're going to leave this Scripture right here out because it steps on toes. And that's what it was. It was like, I want to live my way, and I'm going to go my way and that's what Israel did. And just as it is today, the Israelites possessed a form of godliness without power. And the king of Syria brought men from Babylon and placed them in the cities of Samaria. They feared not the Lord. And that's in 17, 24, and 25. That's what it says. It says, the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, and then he named some names there, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel, and they took possession of Samaria, Samaria and dealt in its cities, and it was so at the beginning of their dwelling there they, that they did not fear the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. So he put them in there, these people from other areas, and put them in to, you know, in there, and they didn't know about God. They didn't know about worshiping God. So everything started going where they didn't fear God. And, they, and it says that's what Israel, that's what was happening. And the devil's focus stays on those precious ones who have set their hearts wholly on loving and pleasing God. You see... In this story, the nation of Judea represents the Lord's church here on earth. She is the target of Satan because she is under covenant with the Lord and therefore possesses a tremendous threat to the kingdom of darkness. So we see already right here in the scriptures, it's talking about these people, Hezekiah, Judea, they were the ones following God. So what is Satan? Satan's like, okay, these people are a threat to me. So what I'm going to do here? So he, he's, already, he's already causing trouble. Hezekiah, the king of Judea, was a godly man. It says that in, uh, in the 18th chapter, in the 3 through 5, it says, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He removed the high places, the break, uh, the break, the images, and cut down the groves. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. So you sit there and you think to yourself, okay, here he is. It said he was a man of God. It said he did what God asked. So where is this letter that's supposed to be coming from Satan? What is this... What is this all about? Here, here, here is why the man of sin was out to destroy Hezekiah. Because he was a man of God. Because he followed God. Because he loved God. He did what God... It, it wasn't popular. 
But he did what God, you know, told him to do, what God was, was, uh, what God was pleasing in God's sight. And it was very same reason Satan will attack us. That's why he attacks you. So many people, I don't know if people have ever told you this, that, oh, once you get saved, everything's going to be great, because it, it doesn't work that way. Because Satan's going to want you back. He's going to fight to get you back. You see, in 2 Kings 18, 6 through 7, he, the king, claved to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments. He obeyed him. And the Lord was with him, and, and he prospered, wheresoever he went forth. So no more tribute to the enemy. You see, up to this time, Judea was a servant nation to Assyria. They had to give money to them. They had to, you know, give their dues to them and everything else like that, basically, which was a form of bondage. This is the man of sin had yet to place in Zion. You see, the king of Assyria taxed Judea 300 talents of gold. And basically, I kind of looked that up. One talent of gold represented about 70 pounds, 75 pounds of gold. So you think I need a lot of gold. That's a lot of gold that they, were want, they had to give to Assyria. Now, if we go on and we see in the 18th chapter, 15 through 16, and Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord, in the treasures of the king's house, all the time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord. And see, this picture is a compromise that can be found in God's church today. You see, we see this letter and we say, what can we learn from this? This is basically representing the church, Satan, you know, and God's people. You see, the church walking in fear and intimidation according to worldliness and her miss, afraid to call sin what it is. I mean, that's exactly what it is right there. He was intimidated there for a little while. He was afraid. How many of us are afraid all the time, especially now in this day and time, with everything that's going on, every time you turn around the corner, you're hearing about something going wrong. You're hearing about somebody getting sick. You're hearing about somebody that is, that's, you know, don't get, don't get me wrong, I, I believe... You know, we need to be careful with COVID, and I think there is precautions, there's things like that. But we need to be careful that with all this stuff that's going on, that it doesn't take a hold of us in such a fear that we do not do what God has called us to do. And, and that's where it's getting to be. It's getting to be in churches all over the place that people are getting so scared. I mean, honestly, look at our church here, don't get me wrong, I don't want everybody to say, oh, you're saying, don't, don't take this, don't do this, I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying, anymore, it's getting to a point if, that, you know, we were running on Wednesdays, I know before COVID, we were running, what, 50, 60 people easily. We're half of that now. Sundays, we're running about uh, uh, almost half, you know, and on Sunday nights, we're running half, and it's, you know, we get so caught up in fear. We get so caught up in, 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 in everything else that sometimes we don't let God, we don't, you know, we let the enemy take away what God has given us. He, you know, we, we, we fear and, and we get scared. And God has called us to do so much for Him. But it's hard for us to do it when we're scared all the time. Fear can get a hold of you and then you can't do what God has called you to do. Watch what happened when Hezekiah stepped out on faith toward God. You see, when he decided there would be no more appeasing the devil, no more halfway discipleship, no more compromise or worldly ties, regardless of the cost. Now, that's easy to say. It's easy to say, okay, God, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. I'm going to go forward, and no matter what happens, I'm going to stick with you. That's easier said than done a lot easier said than done. You see, the moment you give up the world and put your life completely in the hands of the Lord, you've got to watch out. I'm not trying to scare anybody or say, oh, no, well, I don't want to get, you know, I'm just going to stay in my own little bubble. As we go on, everywhere you look, you will see the enemy standing against you. Satan uses devices against those who trust the Lord. He doesn't want you. He wants you scared. He wants you afraid. He wants you in that little bubble. He wants you off to the side where you can't do him no damage. 
He knows how dangerous you are when you're obeying God, when you're doing what God has called you to do. He knows that He is helpless unless we let Him make us helpless. But you see, here it is. All hell will come against you. You will become the target of the devil and you will come under siege from the man of sin. You will be tested severely to see if you really trust God in all the things that you, you know, He does. Because as soon as you say, God, I'm following you, the devil's going to be like, no, no, and I'm going to prove you you're not. You're just talking. You really don't want to. As soon as things get tough, you're going to be right back into it again. Everywhere you look, you will see the enemy standing. You see, let's consider Satan's devices against the people, uh, remnant people, those who have decided to trust God. All to him. You see, the first trick, uh, uh, the man of sin, is to question your commitment to fully trust God. See, like I said, the devil's really not stupid. Not trying to give him credit. I'm just trying to say we have to be careful because he knows how to get in the heads. Right here. He knows how to get in here. He knows how to get on your shoulder and talk to you. The king's ambassador said to them in 2 Kings 18, uh, in the 19th, 18th chapter, 19 through the 20. I'm going to actually read the, the whole thing here. All right, in the ninth, starting with 19, he says. Then to uh, Revashaka said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, This says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? You speak of having plans and power of, for war, but they are mere words, and whom do you trust that you rebel against me? So the accusation is God is not going to get you through this mess. That's what he's telling them. He's right out telling them, Why, who, who are you trusting in? You're going down, you're, gonna, you're in trouble, and your faith is not going to work. How many has got that? God, I'm going to trust in you. I don't know what's happening right now. I don't know what's going to happen. But God, I'm going to trust in you. And that's the first thing the enemy wants to start talking into your ear. Well, who are you banking this on? Who are you trusting in? Who is this? He wants to start getting that doubt into your head. You know, your faith is not going to work, he says. Oh, it's not going to work. You failed. It's not. You don't have that kind of faith. Are you in a mess, really deep trouble? Have you been in that situation where everything seems to be falling apart? I don't know how I'm going to pay bills. I don't know, you know, the job, whatever it is. Has the devil told you God is not going to rescue you? You don't have enough faith. You don't have enough faith. You're not going to make it. You're weak. Your faith is too weak and you're little. You know, you're, you're as good as done. You're done. He likes to get in your ear. He's a jabber jaws. He likes to get in there. And he likes to get in there. And he likes to get in there. Perhaps you're unemployed right now and your bills are slowly mounting up. Sure, you're getting scared because it all looks hopeless. Where am I going to pay my bills next? Where am I going to get the money? Where am I going to be able to do this? I understand that. Through my first divorce, that's how it was. Everything went wrong. You know, we had, I don't want to go into a bunch of details on that, but, you know, some here know how it was. I had no clue how it was going to go on. A house was uh, uh, about to be foreclosed. Uh, by the time they got done taking money out of everything else, you know, for example, maybe it was like, I had $300, I had $500 worth of bills to pay. I had no clue how my check was going to be. I had no clue looking at the bills, looking at the checkbook, looking at everything else. There is no possible way I was going to be able to keep my house. There's no possible way I was going to be able to keep my car, pay my insurance, everything that was going on. And all that was happening, mathematically, there was no way. But at the end of the time, I still paid my tithes and God still was able to. 
Give me money to pay everything else. I still have no clue. I've looked at the bills, looked at the bills, looked at the checkbook, looked at everything. It doesn't add up. There's no way there was money for this. There is no possible way. I had my dad look at it. He's looking at all this stuff. There's no possible way. I had my sister, who's really good stuff. They could look at it. No, there's no possible way. You should not have no money. You should be to the point where you've lost everything already. So I know, even though he's not in my head, you don't got money to pay your tithes. You don't have money to give to God. You don't have money for this. He'll understand. He'll be okay. You know, you just do, you know, you. You take care of you. I said, no, I don't really have, from what I truly made, I didn't have enough to pay the, the, the 10%, but I still gave a lot more than what I had to be able to give, and God still honored that. And I'm a firm believer of that today. Not for you. You are just destined to fail, he says. He says, you are going to end up broke, hounded by creditors, and headed for suicide. You know, he just laughing in spite of all your love for Jesus, in spite of giving up the world, in spite of doing the right thing and trusting God. It's not going to work. That's what he's going to tell you. He's going to tell you that. Listen to the devil talk in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 36, 9, he says, How then will thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants? He says that in here when he's sitting there and he's talking to the other. In other words, what he says is, What can you do to stop trouble? What can you do? How will you make it if you can't even see a month ahead of you, let alone your whole future? How can you possibly survive if there is an army of troubles coming in behind your present one? Do you really be believe God is going to work a miracle for you and get you out of this big mess? Just give up. Just give up. In fact, let's make a deal. He says, let's make a deal, he says. And we've seen that commercial make a deal. Or not commercial, that uh, game show. You know, they got the little box up there. You've already won maybe a couple hundred dollars, and they got a box over here and a box over here, and it says, I'll make you a deal. You know, I'll give you this box. You don't know what's in it. And for that $200, $300, you've just won. See, the devil, that's what he's doing. He says, let's make a deal. Now that the devil adds a new twist, he tells that God is the one behind all your troubles. It's not him. It's not the devil. He's for you. I'm, I'm, I'm for you. You know, I, I'm, I'm here to take care of you. You know, God's going to, God is the one doing all this to you. It's God. You see, in 2 Kings 18, 25, he also says, the Lord says to me, go up against this land and destroy it. That's what he tells him. He says, have I not come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it. The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. The king's telling him, you know, hey, you know, the Lord told me to do this, to come up and destroy you. This is the devil's slickest lie. He makes you believe God has forsaken you, turned you over to trouble and sorrow. Oh, I don't know how many times he's tried that with me. Tries to get that in there. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, this is God, you know. God's doing this, you know. He's, he's left you. He don't, he don't love you. He don't want to help you with this. If he was going to help you with it, he already, he already took care of it. How about that one? I've heard that one a lot. But why would he let this happen to you? It, it's it's, it's got to be God, you know. He wants you to think all your problems are the result of God's punishment for your past sins. But yeah, yeah, but see, it's past. God forgets, forgives, it's gone. He don't bring back what we've done. He don't sit there and have it marked in his little book when we do a mistake. Oh, yeah, I see he did this one too now. I got this one down. Man, your book's getting thick, buddy. He don't say none of that stuff. He don't even have a book. He don't have a record. It's gone. It's over. It's God. It's like, hey, you know, you're, it's, it's forgiven. But don't believe what Satan is out. He's out to destroy you. He's out to try to, to bring you down with him. 
You see, our Lord is a deliverer. He's our fortress. In Isaiah 61.3, it says that He is sent to appoint unto them that morn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, oil of joy for the morning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He might be glorified. No, you're not going down. You are simply under attack. He's simply trying to target you, trying to distract you by the enemy's lies because you've set your heart truly to the Lord. He doesn't like it. He's trying to pull you away. He doesn't like that you are happy and God has given you some joy. Another device Satan will use to intensify his attack on you is by trying to focus your attention on his victories over other Christians. Oh, I remember him doing that to me a few times. My grandmother, he, oh, she was a prayer warrior. And, and I tell you, there was times she was standing in the gap between heaven and hell for her grandchildren and her children. I believe that with all my heart. And she ended up going blind, and she ended up losing her hearing, and then she, it, just got, it just kept going worse and worse. And you see this, and you think to yourself, you know, the enemy telling you, look at this, this is a woman of God, this is one of my own, you know, this is, this is one of God's, and look what, I, look what he's doing to her. Look how this is happening here. Look how I have power over her. Have any of the gods delivered at all? Where are, uh, where are the gods have they delivered? says that in 33 and 34. It says, where are those gods that took care of those people? We conquered them. What makes you think your God's any better? He will boast, I am more powerful than your God. I brought down many men and women, so I want to make you think you can escape. What makes you think you can escape my power? He likes to show you some that have struggled, some good Christian people that love the Lord that are dealing with a lot. He does that. Sometimes he tries to play that game with me, with my, my father who, who is, is like, uh, uh, I wouldn't say like idol as much because God is my idol, but, you know, a, a role model for me and everything that he's went through. And, it, you know, and you look and he sits there and he wants to tell you, oh, look what he's going through. What makes you think it's going to be any better? You see, this is the same voice he says in 2 Kings 18.35. This is the same voice that came from Assyria. Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? What makes you think that they're going to do it, you're going to do any better? Satan will bring your mind all the Christians who claim to be trusting God but who have suffered trouble, sickness, and even death. He will point out some dear old trusted saint, perhaps an elderly widow, an elderly person, somebody that you look to and dearly to that you know that's just a a man or woman of God and has so little to live on that she seems crushed by it. He'll bring that to you and he'll show you and he'll be like, look at that. See how powerful I am. He will say these people trusted God and look what has gotten them. Those fallen Christians were supposed to be so close to the Lord and look how they ended up. They can't make it. How are you going to make it? What makes you think God is going to answer you when so many spiritual Christians are falling? Satan will try to make a deal with you. You see, one of Satan's tricks is to paint this fantastic picture of what your life could be like if you just make a deal with him. Oh, this is so much beautiful. I'll give you this. I'll give you that. I mean, look at what he did with Christ. He took Christ up on the mountain. You see all this? You bow to me, I'll give you all this. Well, first of all, it ain't yours to give. He makes you think God is going to answer you when so many spiritual Christians are falling. He says in 2 Kings 18, 31 through 32... Hearketh not at the Hezekiah, for this saith the king of Israel, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every one of his fig trees, and drink ye every one the waters of his uh, cistern, 
until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, and a land of corn and wine, and land of bread, and vineyards, land of oil, olive, and of honey, that ye may live and not die. And hearketh unto, <clears throat> not unto Hezekiah, when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. He said, Make an agreement with me. Come out here to me. The voice of the devil says, Come on out here and we'll make a deal. Come on. We'll make a deal. I'll make an agreement with you. Come out to me and we'll, we'll, make, a, you know, we'll make a deal. In other words, there's no need for you to be a nobody. No need for you to suffer unjustly. Just come out to your... Uh, out of your narrow, straight-laced ways, and I will fix things for you. I'll take care of you. I'm for you. I'm, I'm there to, to help you. You're going to prosper. I'll give you all the, the money you need, the corn, the oil, the wine, no more bills, no more just making ends meet. I'll open the bank for you. The sad thing is so many people get deceived by it. They see, they suffer, and things are going wrong, and then they're kind of like, okay, I'll, I will. Every compromise you make in your walk with Jesus is a going out to the devil. You're cutting a deal, making a bargain, and then you're selling your soul in the process. He's basically a crooked salesman. He tells you just one little deal and all your problems will be solved. You deserve a break. You have suffered enough and now it's, it's your turn to make it. I'll, I will come and take you away to a land like your own land, he says in verse 30, uh, 32. He says, in other words, you can take God with you. You can still live in the world and have God. That's what he's telling you. You'll have to make some changes, but you'll still, you know, you'll still be you. It won't hurt anything. You can, you can have it all. Jesus and the deal. Yet if you buy into this lie, you'll be the devil's slave. There is no land of wine. There's no land of paradise, oil, that he's promised. The minute you come out, he will slap the chains on your neck and your wrist and, and your feet. And he'll take you off to Babylon. You will never get what he thought, or you thought, you would get. Instead, you're going to get the whips, you're going to get the change, you're going to be in despair, you're going to be broken, you'll, have a, you'll get a taskmaster and, and a slave driver for a father. The satisfying water he promised you is actually poisoned. Here is the real truth about the compromise. It will get you to stay in the Betty Ford Hospital. It will get you the fate of Elvis Presley or John Lennon who spent the last five years of his life stoned. You will live under complete bondage, a slave to the devil and his whims. And finally, as last resort, Satan will send you a threatening letter like he did Hezekiah. Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messenger and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. 2 Kings 19.14 is my favorite part about the whole thing. The most in, inspiring of, of the whole two or three chapters. You see, the messenger who delivered the letter was the devil's agent. It was a letter to reapproach to the living God designed to make God's people fearful. What is he doing to us every day now? Trying to make us fearful. Sending us a letter. Every day he tries to destroy us. It was incarnation of the devil's laugh as he mocked them and said, I am going to cut you down, make you a reapproach, and destroy everything in your house. Have you received a such letter? Maybe it's the divorce papers you received and saying, Satan, you're a failure. What God does to do, what, what good does it do to serve God and deny yourself? It didn't save your marriage, he says. It's all your fault. It could have been avoided, phony, failure, give it all up. It may be the pink slip on the job. 
So that's what you get when you follow Jesus, he says, huh? A swift kick. Nobody wants you. You're too old or you're not, you're not skilled enough. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You're going down. You're going to lose everything you have. You won't have any rent money or house, pay, pay your house payment or able to take care of your family. You're finished. That's what, he's going to, that's what he tells you. Or what about the letter from the attorney? Pay up or you face criminal charges. Your time's up. I don't care that you don't have a job. I don't care that hours have been cut back. I don't care that, you know, it's beyond your control. It is a letter of shame and reproach to try to make you fearful and alarmed. And what about the x-ray? Black and white. You have terminal disease. You have cancer. You have this. You have that. It's hopeless. And Satan says, you believe Jesus is going to heal you? Well, where is he now? Why do you still have to suffer? Where is your God? You give him everything and you look at what happens. He gives you nothing but continued suffering. He wants to sit there and lie to you. He wants to, to you to, to hate God. So what do you do when you're confronted with a message from the devil? Do what Hezekiah did. First you spread the enemy's letter out before the Lord as Hezekiah did. And Hezekiah spread it out before the Lord and he prayed. He laid it out before him. He didn't get upset. He didn't throw a fit. He didn't say everything is lost and everything is no good anymore. I'm just doomed and gloomed. No, what he did is he took it up there before the Lord and he laid it out right there. We have to lay our problems out before the Lord. Not to everybody on Facebook. Not to anybody and everybody. Don't get me wrong. We have people we need to go to once in a while. Hey, I need you to help pray with me. Things are going rough. But we also need to go first before the Lord and say, This is my problem. You know my problem. Here it is. Here it is. Pray and seek the Lord. Don't ever talk or reason with the devil. You see, in Second Kings, I'll read exactly what he says. In 2 Kings, in the 19th chapter, in 14 and 15. And, and Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messenger and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord, spread it out before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the shrimp, you are God, you alone, all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of what this man says. Listen, which he is sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Israel have laid waste the nations of their land and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord, O God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God alone. I love how he says that. It's closing here. I love how he says that. He goes up there and says, You hear what this man's saying about you? You see that? See? But the people held their peace and he answered him. Not a word. They didn't say anything as it was said. You see, God, read this letter and he laughed. God laughed. He says, what is this? This is it. God took this letter personally because these are my children. These are my people that are following. Devil, you didn't give this to them. This letter was to me. This is to me. Whom hast thou reapproached and blasphemed against whom thou hast exalted thy voice and lift up thy eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? You see, saints, no matter how many demons invade, no matter how many kingdoms of darkness threaten the church, God is still going to take care of us. You see, the Lord has sent His own letter to the devil. He says, your time is coming. Your time is coming. These are my children. I will take care of them. In my time, things are going to get a little rough. Things are going to get a little tough. But I will take care of them in their time. 
please remember that no matter what's going on in closing, whatever your issue is, whatever your problem is, no matter how serious it is, just spread it out before the Lord. God, this is yours. You see this. You know this. And there's nothing you cannot do. I'm leaving this to you. They turn around, and God took care of that whole army. Took care of that whole army. Thousands. Boom. Wasn't supposed to happen. Same thing God's going to do for each and every one of us. God is great. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, and God, we just ask that you give us the strength each and every day. As the enemy attacks us, as the enemy tries to, to turn us away from you, God, help us to see that you are in full control. Give us the strength, God, to tune him out. Kick him off of our shoulder, God, to knock him and step on him, because God, he is beneath us. As long as we serve you, he has no authority. We give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. If you felt broken